So, so yeah, I want you to talk about these two conceptual questions or more precisely the topics that relate to these two conceptual questions. So this first question asks, uh, both electric fields and magnetic fields can exert a force on a moving electric charge, compare and contrast the electric force and magnetic force on a moving electric charge specifically bring up. Okay, um, and there are many things you can bring up and I won't go through all of it. The one particular point I want you to go over is the point that uh, relates to question three. As it says, considering the magnetic force law, and in fact, that's uh, the starting place where you think about commonalities and difference between electric force and magnetic force. So the Magnetic force law is given by this expression. The force due to magnetic field on a moving electric charge is given by electric charge times its velocity. That's why it's important it's moving. Cross product with magnetic field. And for reference, the electric force, whether on a moving charge or not. It, so with the electric force, it's given by the amount of charge times the electric field and here it's uh, independent of whether the charge is moving or not um, so you know this will uh, lead to the acceleration of the charge because this is equal to mass times acceleration and um, if the charge is at rest then the direction in which it's uh, accelerating will be you know same direction as the velocity same direction of electric field now if the charge happens to be moving in some perpendicular direction then the electric field will push it in some perpendicular direction at least initially and then um, so there's that so with the electric force it doesn't depend on velocity, like the fact that charge is moving or not. It doesn't matter. Other than uh, when you are trying to figure out the exact trajectory of the charge, then the initial velocity, of course, matters. Um, with the magnetic force law, the form of the law is different. With the electric force, it's a parallel to the field regardless of direction of velocity. So you can just get the direction of acceleration as being parallel to the force which is parallel to the field. Pretty simple. It, it results in a pretty simple, predictable motion that you can um, draw a lot of great analogies to gravitational force with. Uh, there's, um, that's one way you can really get a good handle on understanding of electric force, because it's so similar to gravitational force. Other than that, you can repel it. So. With the magnetic force, it's uh, complicated. So even the direction of force, this is what this question is getting at, you know, considering this law, are the velocity and magnetic field always perpendicular? One question. Are the force and velocity always perpendicular? A different question. Are the magnetic force and field always perpendicular? A third different question. It's actually asking all possible questions about three vector quantities because what this uh, with this uh, relationship here what you have is uh, three vector quantities magnetic force which is a vector you have velocity which is also a vector <laughs> and you have magnetic field which is also a vector so this these questions are basically asking all the possible pairwise relationships between these three quantities, you know, between these two, are they always perpendicular? It's asking. And between these two, are they always perpendicular? It's asking. And between these two, are they always perpendicular? <laughs> it's asking. So, um, so this is where good understanding of cross product is helpful because it's really that it's that property of cross product that uh, tells you everything there is to know. Um, but before I go into that discussion for two or three minutes, uh, let's just uh, get an easy answer. Um, when you look at this uh, expression here and ask the question, does this um, impose any constraining relationship between velocity and field? 
I hope after you think through it for a bit, you realize, oh, the answer is no. Um, the velocity and the magnetic field direction, you can, it's an initial condition, you can choose freely. You have seen in a previous demonstration where there's a simulation, I can set the initial velocity so it's a parallel to the magnetic field. I can set a perpendicular electric field. And in the real world, you can set it anywhere in between. So this particular pairwise relationship, the answer is no, they're not always perpendicular. Um, you will often see them set up perpendicular because that's a kind of situation where you get interesting motion, you get the circular motion, but uh, they don't have to be. It's often set up that way, but they don't have to be set up that way. So, so we have two remaining questions, you know, is this relationship always the case? And is this relationship always the case? And it comes down to the property of cross product. So uh, you see this in the lecture. This is how we define cross product. Uh, so I, I want to try to, I want to encourage you to think about cross product in an as non-arbitrary way as possible. Because I think uh, by this point, you will have been taught a lot of different uh, tools in thinking about cross product. You might have been told a parallelogram rule. I think so I heard some of you mentioning that. And, as a rule goes, okay, that's fine. Uh, I guess <laughs> it, if it's a helpful rule, then great. It's a helpful rule to use. And you have heard the right-hand rule. And um, and I guess to the extent that right-hand rule is how we remember the direction of cross product, good. That's um, another thing to dismiss entirely. But what I want to strongly emphasize is that this is a geometric problem. It's something that ideally isn't constrained by some human convention or some mnemonic device. Um, the geometric problem you have is that you have two vectors, V and B. And I'm just going to draw them on this plane with some particular angle for the sake of concreteness. But really, those two vectors can be any two vectors pointing any which way. And the challenge of the cross product is how do you define a third vector so that it has some consistent relationship with these two vectors? And as you ponder the geometry problem, what sticks out is the kind of geometric object that you can define using two vectors or two lines, which are very close to two vectors. And one geometric figure you can define using two lines is a plane. So I just drew the plane <laughs> containing these two vectors. And this plane, um, if you imagine the kind of infinite plane, um, is uh, it's uniquely defined by those two vectors. So if uh, my both my V and B are vectors on this uh, screen, then then the screen defines that plane uniquely. Uh, I mean, you can translate it, but as far as the rotation of the plane goes, it's uniquely defined. Now the challenge is, okay, I have that plane, but um, plane is not a vector. <laughs> it, it, it's a two-dimensional object. So how do you describe, um, how do you associate a vector with that plane? And that's where I go through this discussion in the lecture, and it comes down to, uh, so kind of short circuiting all the discussion comes down to you define so in geometry when you have a plane one way you can associate the orientation of the plane with a single line is to describe the plane in terms of a line that's perpendicular to the plane then um, so in the case of this plane that I have drawn if you look at the line that's perpendicular to the screen there's only one line like that. There's no other line that would both be perpendicular to the plane and not point in the same direction as the line perpendicular to the screen. So, so that would uh, be a way to associate a line with a plane. And the problem that the right-hand rule is solving is when you have that line, a line can point in two directions. It could point into the screen or it could point out of the screen. So which of those two do you pick? 
And when you have, you know, V cross B, is it going to be the same as B cross V? And uh, for many good reasons, these are not the same. In fact, the property of cross product goes that V cross B is equal to minus B cross V. So the sign direction of the cross product depends on order. So it's a matter of choosing, okay, when you have V cross B, uh, do we choose that to go into the plane? Or do we choose that to come out of the plane? And depending on which one you choose, if you have B cross B, you'd want it to go the other way. And it's at this point where our uh, effort at trying to describe this uh, as non-arbitrarily as possible is at a wall. Because uh, we don't have any um, objective way. We can just choose one direction or the other uh, by conven as convention. It and um, the worldwide convention that somehow works with 90% of human beings is the right hand rule because the 90% of us use the right hand as our dominant hand. So the, that's where the right hand rule really comes from. It's uh, where we need to pick one or the other direction arbitrarily. It doesn't really matter other than that we are consistent. And uh, not right hand being the dominant hand for super majority of us, it, it's, it, it's easy to be consistent when we use right hand rule. And you know, I, I'm not left handed myself, so I don't know this from first hand experience, but I imagine the kind of motion we do, it's easy enough to do with your non dominant hand. So, um, so even for the left handed people, using your right hand to apply right hand rule. I think it's relatively, uh, it's not that much harder. <laughs> so, and so the right hand rule chooses between those two possible vector directions. So when I do V cross B, I see my thumb pointing into the screen. So this is the direction that we choose by convention for V cross B. And I, I want you to uh, reflect on how we chose this direction. We started by looking for a vector that is perpendicular to this entire plane. And when you have a vector that's perpendicular to a plane, it's perpendicular to any vector within the plane. So it's perpendicular to V. So V cross V, the force, is perpendicular to V. And it is perpendicular to B, the magnetic field. So the answer to the, the second and third questions are, yes, they are always perpendicular by construction. Now, when you have that, there's a really interesting um, mechanical property or kinematical property. Um, let me try to walk through this quickly. How do I put it? Um, I think the things that are uh, useful for me to review briefly are these definitions from Physics 4A, which you've seen in when we did the thermodynamics and uh, when we are doing <laughs> electrostatics. Work done, mechanical work done, is the dot product between force and displacement. And um, you can kind of... Um, from here, you can look at some other related expressions like a uh, infinitesimal amount of work done by a force as well. The force time that product with the infinitesimal displacement. Okay, uh, it's this is the infinitesimal version of the definition of work that you're hopefully familiar with. Now, imagine dividing this the whole thing by infinitesimal amount of time for some reason, then <laughs> on the left-hand side, you have infinitesimal amount of work divided by infinitesimal amount of duration of time. On the right-hand side, I have force, that product with, let me uh, group with uh, these two things together. I have an infinitesimal amount of um, displacement divided by infinitesimal amount of time. Now I'm going to abuse notation a little bit and not go through the rigorous proof of proving that uh, this quantity on the left-hand side is really the uh, rate of change, um, I guess a 
rate of change of energy or rate at which work is done. So this is really the power. So what we are calculating for this is a power. How quickly is energy changing or is energy transferring? And the right hand side, well, if I just look at this, hey, that looks like a velocity to me. So let me write it this way, force dot product with a velocity. So this is what it's saying. Rate at which energy of something changes is given by force dot product with a velocity. And this should be consistent with all the things that you experience in mechanics. You pull something, like you pull a cart along a table, and the direction that you're pulling it in, and the direction the cart is moving, it's the same direction. Then, uh, then as you are pulling, you are accelerating, you are putting more kinetic energy into it. Now, on the other hand, we have this property for magnetic force which means we can always say this for the magnetic force. Coming from this basic definition of magnetic force, we can say that magnetic force, that product with the velocity, because they are always perpendicular to each other, it will always be zero. What this means is uh, magnetic force does no work amount of power due to magnetic force, at least static magnetic force, is zero. Magnetic force doesn't change kinetic energy. And um, this uh, mechanical property, it's really consistent with um, uh, what you see. So the kind of the particle motion that you see particles undergo when it's uh, under a uni ma uniform magnetic field, uniform and constant magnetic field, is that it's undergoing, it's undergoing a uniform circular motion. So its uh, speed isn't changing, its kinetic energy isn't changing. The magnetic field isn't, well, it's uh, accelerating the particles in the way that the centripetal acceleration accelerates. It's a, a vector quantity that's associated with the change of the a vector that, uh, you know, and the change of vector here is the change in direction. But magnetic force does not speed up the particle. It doesn't accelerate particles in that way. Um, and, and, and there are exceptions, but those exceptions will always involve a changing magnetic field. So, um, so, so in magnetostatics, we can say with no exceptions, no qualifications, that magnetic force does no work. Magnetic force um, doesn't uh, speed up or slow down particles. Um, even in the scenarios that you saw with the magnetic bottle, where the particle is pushed back, um, the speed at which these particles are moving won't be changing. It, it, uh, the, that's the property of static magnetic field, that it does not put in more energy, it also doesn't take out energy. It just changes the direction in which the particles are moving. So, so yeah, that's really what I want you to talk about, looking at these conceptual questions.